Hi, in this video I will make a demonstration and explain how to service a cup and cone bicycle hub. For the demonstration I will use this rear wheel because I think that rear wheels are a bit more complicated. The front ones are often completely symmetrical, not always but often so everything is the same except you don't have to pay attention to which side is which. Plain, simply put. Now, before we start, uh, when you're servicing a, a cup and cone hub, why would you do that? Well, those hubs require regular service maintenance about once a year or every 5,000 kilometers or just over 3,000 miles for those not familiar with the metric system. And uh, depending on your riding conditions, you might want to go with uh, more frequent maintenance schedule, but a safe bet, in my experience, is once a year or 5,000 kilometers, even if you ride in dirty, muddy or sandy conditions, that does it. If you neglect to do that, then you will have a damage. The damage first happens to the bearing balls, then to the cones, and finally to the cups. And once the cups are damaged, the hub is practically toast and you need to release the wheel with the new hub. That is the first thing to pay attention to. The second thing is to make sure that you do have a wheel with cup and cones because here we have a wheel with cartridge bearings and this is what those bearings look like. They usually have some sort of seal or dust wiper, dust protection. It's not a real seal that that really seals and prevents but this is the the bearings and these are just punched out and the new ones are pushed, pressed in. I will show how these look like. This is a cartridge bearing without any seals and without any grease. This is what it looks like and they are generally not serviced, just replaced when they get worn. You take one out and put a new one in. And now for the cups and cones. Cup and cone bearings have an, an axle and on, on that axle uh, this is a cone, it is screwed on and it is held in place by a lock nut. So when they are, when they are tightened against each other, it stays in place. And there is a, a hub, hub has as a part of a hub body the, the cup. This is from a bottom bracket, but the principle is the same. There's a cone and a cup and the bearing balls go inside between those two and that's what keeps them locked in place and the bearing keeps rolling. You will see that once I disassemble, but this is the basic working principle. And if this part that is on the hub gets damaged or pitted, the hub is toast. While these can be sourced as replacement parts, it's a bit difficult to find in my country and even abroad. They are not always available because there are different uh, shapes, different angles, different thicknesses or depths on for different kinds of, of hubs but generally they can be sourced and the first thing that goes are the bearings and for bearings and for buying bearings I'll put a link to my article explaining bicycle bearing ball standard size so that you can look it up and uh, shop in your local hardware stores because Shimano original bearing balls cost an arm and leg it's complete nonsense you can get uh, high quality bearings a lot cheaper in and support your local hardware stores. So now let's get on with servicing a cup and cone bearing. This is a typical example. We have a Shimano Freehub. I'm not sure which model. TX505. Okay. And we will service it. I have already removed the cassette and the disc. This one is a, is a disc brake hub. And those are explained in a separate video. Here we will just get on to servicing the, the free hub. What you will need of the tools. Let's take a look at that. You usually, in most cases, need 17 millimeter wrenches to unscrew and tighten the, the outer lock nuts. I like to use two for some, for some operations, but one, technically one can be enough. Sometimes, on some systems, you will need a cone wrench 17 millimeter. 
if the lock nut is designed so that this cannot fit. If it get, has some outer section that is wider, then you will need a, a cone wrench even for the lock nut. And on some newer Shimano hubs, as I've shown in a separate video that I will link in this video's description, you need a 5mm hex wrench or an Allen wrench of 5mm for the lock nut. But the way they are used is practically the same, just the tools are different, but the operation is identical. Then, you will need for the rear hubs, in most cases, 15 millimeter cone wrenches. Any wider regular wrenches or spanners will not fit. You usually need special, the thin down cone wrenches. And I, I'm very happy and uh, can recommend Unior. This is model 1617-2DP. I'm not sure if it's visible from my paint, paint coding the sizes. This is perhaps a better. This is a lot thicker for larger lock rings on some hubs, but that's the model. These are quite durable and the handle is ergonomic and you can easily use them and they've served me well. I'm very happy with this. And you generally can go get away with one, but I like having two just in case, as I will show later on in the video. Also, some things that are often needed if you're dealing with uh, quick release hubs. I have these two like old spacers from some rear hub that I use to s help me uh, more quickly set the bearing preload, as I'll explain later. So that's a good idea. You might need a way to remove any dust seals of the hub. It's not really necessary, but it can help. So you can use some screwdrivers help yourself perhaps with some steel rod that is at least five or more millimeters thick and has some sort of coating to prevent any spoke damage as I also show later. And for rear hubs of Shimano, this uh, Unior tool that is for entirely different purpose, it's called Hub Genie 1758-4. It can also be used to remove the, the seals, the, the dust protectors from the hub when a hub has them. You will also need some grease. I wrote uh, two very de long and detailed articles about grease, bicycle bearing grease, which is the best, and that is a very slippery slope, pun intended. There's a lot of debate which is the best. In my opinion, uh, grease is like soap. If you use it regularly, it's no problem. If you don't use it regularly, even the best one in the world <laughs> won't, won't make a difference. It won't help because dirt intrusion is the nemesis of bicycle bearings. So even water washout or other problems are far less problematic compared to dirt intrusion. That is why regular maintenance is important. And you usually can get away with any, any kind of grease as, as long as it's regularly replaced and cleaned. And I like to use anti-seize. I wrote another article about anti-seize pastes. So I use that for anything that is not bearing, that doesn't need greasing, but slides, uh, uh, gets uh, screwed on and so on. So as I will show in this video, I think I haven't forgotten anything. Uh, sometimes a magnet is uh, helpful to take the old be bolt bearings out. But if you are planning to reuse the old bolt bearings, it's best not to use magnet because they will get magnetized and then draw any sort of metal particles of dirt or anything and damage the the bearing. So if you are planning to reuse the bearing balls, it's best to not use any magnet. And if you are replacing them, I buy them cheaply in thousands of good quality. This is G10 quality. This is quite, quite good as explained in my article about bicycle ball bearings. So I don't uh, waste time cleaning and expecting each separate bearing ball. I just throw them away when I'm doing service and put the new ones in. It's, it's simpler for me and saves me a lot of time. It's not eco-friendly, but saves me time, so sorry. And now we can get on with this. Here, the first thing that I do when I'm servicing a bearing, of course, you will need a lot of uh, either some wipes or some old cloths. The first thing I do is to clean the outside to prevent any dirt from coming in and making my cleaning job more difficult. So I just roughly 
clean it up on the outside. My hubs usually look a lot more awful than this one. This one is super clean. And let's do the same on the other side. All right. Now for the for the rear hubs, I usually start on the left hand side. For the front hubs with disc brakes, I start on the right hand side because the left hand side is often occupied by the disc mounting area. So you cannot always access the, the cone to cope, keep it in place and unscrew the lock nut. Uh, while with the uh, uh, rim brake front hubs, it's irrelevant. So whatever you start with is okay. So here we're going to the left side because on the right there's only the lock, no, lock nut protruding and I cannot access the, the cone while on the left hand side I can access the cone and the, the lock nut. So I will put a 15 millimeter, you use the smallest one that fits, this is 15 millimeter cone wrench, I'm sliding it here. A normal wrench of a large or that is wider would not fit here. So I'm holding it in place with that and I'm using a 17 millimeter wrench to unscrew the lock nut. I need to turn it anti-clockwise in order to unscrew it. And the easiest way to do it is to keep both wrenches closely and just tighten them here. This is now loosened. I can now keep on turning it, unscrewing it. All right. Here, this is the lock nut. Whichever part I remove, I clean it right away. Clean cloth here and I will clean it and you need to be careful whether parts are symmetrical or not. Sometimes it's logical, sometimes it's not as obvious why they are put the way they are, but if they are not symmetrical, remember how they were before you put them away, before you remove them. This one has the serrated outer edge to keep the wheel in place when you put it in the, in the frame to prevent it from sliding. And the inner edge that uh, puts pressure on the lock nut, on, on the cone, is smooth. And the way I usually do it is that I, when I remove a part, I put it on its back so that I know once I pick it up, it goes this way. Whatever works for you, whatever is logical, do it that way. And I will put the left hand side parts on the left side of this, just to avoid any mixing, because it's often not symmetrical. Now, now I'll remove the spacer, wipe it clean. This is not really, really necessary, it just feels good to have it all nice and clean. I'm sure there's a diagnosis for this, but I still enjoy it. Here it is, the second one. And now I'm going for the, for the cone. Sometimes, after you unscrew the lock nut, the cone will be very tight against the bearing. So you might have to use the 17 millimeter wrench on the opposite side to keep it in place and use the, the cone wrench to start unscrewing it if it's very tight. Yeah, that's the case here now. I couldn't easily unscrew this by hand. I needed to start it with this and now I can use my hand. When I'm doing this, I'm holding it on the opposite side to prevent the, the axle from falling out and I can turn the opposite side while keeping it pushed. And I'm pulling on the right, on this side. And here it's coming out. Bearing balls might drop out if there's not enough grease or the grease has been too soft or something. So if you plan to save them and keep them for later use, be mindful. Okay. Here we have the left hand side cone. I will clean it and expect and inspect it. What I'm looking for here 
are any kinds of serrations or burrs on this path that the this track that the bearing balls have made so it's silverly colored now and i'm looking if there's any sort of deformation here any anything that's not smooth that's called uh, burring i think and it means that if there is some that the cone is toast this one looks okay okay so I'm, this it went in like this and i'm putting it on its back so to speak in order which in which i will put them back onto the hub now we need to remove the axle from the right hand side and uh, the bearing balls will likely drop out when we do this okay here it is the axle is out this is the right hand side cone i will also clean any grease okay this one looks nice it's not pitted i don't see any damage on it sometimes it's difficult to notice that with the naked eye and so for that you might need a magnifying glass with the light or you can use a ball roller pen and you just slide it around and feel any burring it will give you feedback on your on your hand when you see when you notice that it's scratching just use it gently I heard the story that Americans invent, invented, invested millions of dollars for inventing a pen for writing in space in the zero gravity environment and the Russians took a carbon pencil, you know, like with, with graphite and I, I found that funny, even if it's not true. And now uh, to get back to, the, to this. If you, once I've done this, the next thing that I do is to make sure that these are properly locked because some hubs, some mechanics don't lock them properly and even though I don't need to remove them, I want to make sure they're tight. So I'm tightening the, the lock nut, checking if it's tight enough. Okay, it looks good. Another thing that I had forgotten to mention is when your wheel is assembled, the, if you need to check if the axle protrudes the, by the same length on the left and the right hand side. If it doesn't, check if there's some reason on the frame for one side to be a lot further out. If you see no, no reasonable explanation, then count the number of threads on each side. And if there's like three threads or two on one side and five or six on the other, then see how much you need to unscrew the, the one side to make them both even. So when you unscrew this by one, one thread less sticking out from this part, then when you assemble it and set the preload, the other one will be, will be showing one more thread. So make sure that it's centered. Also, if you want to make sure that the axle is straight, that it's not bent, in that case you need to memorize this distance, either by measuring the depth or by counting the threads then unlock it unscrew it completely and start turning the the axle on a very flat area and if it if it has a bend you will notice it like it will have a small belly in the middle as it turns around so that's another thing to pay attention to with quick release axles if they are bent you will also notice it when you're inserting the the quick release skewer that it will start not going easily because it has a, if the axle has a bend inside. So that's another sign to look out for. This one looks okay. Okay, I'm putting it aside. And now we need to remove the bearing balls and clean the, the, the cups of the, of the bearing. And for removing the balls, I will use magnet because I'm throwing them away. There sh they should have nine, there should be nine. In my article about bicycle ball bearing sizes, I wrote the most common numbers and sizes of bearing balls for various types of bearings, whether they are front, rear, or pedals, or whatever. Okay. 
there, depending on how much grease there was inside, you can also have bearing balls fall outside of the hub completely or have them fall into the, the canal between the two cups. In that case, you need some way of getting them out, either using a screwdriver or helping a bit with gravity or using a magnet. Okay, now that all the bearing balls are out, I will show two ways of removing the, these dust seals. Some hubs have dust seals put on the outside of this. So they are not stuck in the, in the hub, but they are put on the cone. And then as you screw it in, the, the dust seal goes in place. It's a lot easier to do maintenance with those. Also, some Shimano hubs have both the seals on the hub and on the cone. That way they make sort of an overlap to make the dirt intrusion even more difficult. But uh, from what I could see, it's more difficult. It does more difficulty for maintenance than it does for the dirt intrusion. There's a lot of dirt in such hubs as well. I'm not very fond of that solution. I prefer those hubs that have the dust seal put onto this and Shimano doesn't seem to make those anymore, unfortunately. I will show you what it looks like. Here, this is what, what that system looks like. The dust seals are an integral, in, 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 integral part of the, of the cone. It's a lot more practical, for me at least. Now, when it comes to this, I would generally advise against taking this out because it's a relatively weak and thin uh, metal sheet and it can easily get deformed. So you should just spend some more effort to try and get the cloth inside and clean it all the way and that's it. But in case I want to inspect to see if there's any damage or wear and to clean it more thoroughly, yes, I can take it out. There are several ways of doing it. One way is to, in this case, I can easily uh, use a screwdriver and just get it out. But as I'm leaning my screwdriver, here you can see it hitting this other part. So I'm trying to deform it, not take it out. That is why I need something like this to lean here. And then I can put my screwdriver against it and, and open it. I usually do that on my lap. For the front hubs, they will have something that looks a bit more like this. So you will need to put this against the spokes and then get the screwdriver inside and hold this firmly in place as best as you can and I put this to prevent any spokes from getting damaged. I use this from some, for some other uses as well because for this use it would have been better if this were a bit more flat and not turning around. But let's see if this works. I will try to from different angles push it out slowly, gradually. Okay. This one seems pretty stubborn. In this case, I can use a, a wrench as well, but it's not going easily. No, it's pretty stuck. I could risk putting a lot more force with a screwdriver here and take it out if I were really, really into it, but with a lot of effort and a nice thing to put in here that holds in place properly, you can get it out. However, I have a better tool for that and I'm happy to use it in these cases. This is the Unior Hub Genie that I can just, as you screw this in, this spread out. And so I can screw it in, tighten it and then take the, the dust seal out. This is the left hand side one, I need to memorize, memorize that. So I'm putting it all the way in and screwing it in. Okay, seems nicely seated. Now let's give it a try. And it's out. This one works with a 14 millimeter wrench. I need to loosen it. And now I need to clean it. Okay. 
this is the left hand side one it went in like this so I will put it on its head upside down here now for the right hand side one it's the same thing Okay, it's out. I won't be needing this tool right now anymore. Okay, the same thing again. It went in this way, so I'm putting it upside down. And now, <clears throat> now we have it all disassembled. I probably perhaps made it sound a bit more complicated than it is, but it's a relatively simple, straightforward process for which you basically need one 17 millimeter wrench, usually or the appropriate size for the lock nut, and one cone wrench, and that's it. You need some grease and perhaps spare bearing balls, and that's it. So you need to disassemble it, clean it, and then reassemble it, which I will show in a minute, and it's very simple. Before reassembling it, I need to clean the, the cups. So the, the first thing I do is try to get any, any excess grease from the inside, any dirt and so on. And it's easier when I'm looking at what I'm doing. This way I'm just trying not to block the camera. I'm also trying not to scratch the area where the bearing balls go with my screwdriver, just away from it to, to remove any excess grease. Doing it the same thing on the opposite side. And I'm trying to get on the inside where I can see some, some grease being stuck. Because I don't want any grease getting stuck on the axle as I'm putting it back in after I've cleaned and lubricated everything. Okay. Okay. Now I've taken out all the big parts. Now I can use a cloth or something similar to clean it all nicely. And it's easier doing this when the dust protective, those dust protective seals are removed. And now I'm ins inspecting this for any pitting. Need some light. Okay, we'll try to show it on camera in a minute just to clean the other side. If you want to be really thorough, you can use also some cotton cloth and put it all the way inside through and clean it all nicely. But generally, if there aren't any large chunks of grease getting in the way of the axle it is not really important and it won't make much of a difference okay now let's take some more light and see what we're looking for okay here i hope you can see the like a lighter section where the bearing balls are going around that's where they're sliding along and i'm looking for any kind of any kind of wear or pitting on that area Here I will show it. This is the, the section I'm looking at. I think you can see it. The one that is of a different color. That is important to make sure that it's clean and has no pitting. As I said, the bearing balls and the, the cones are the first to give, they will first get damaged. Only after that, the cups will get damaged if the previous two are not replaced and if the hub is not serviced in time. So when I see that the cones are okay, I know that most probably the cups are okay. However, if it is a wheel that I'm not familiar with, maybe someone replaced the cones. People do that sometimes while the cups still have damage. So it's a good idea if you are not familiar with the, the wheel, 
to remove these dust wipers and inspect closely the, the cups as well, at least on your first go and then do the regular maintenance. Now we will show how to pack it all up and put it together. It's simple. And the first thing I do is to put some grease. I need to put the grease on the area where the bearing balls will be put. And for this I'm using the semi-hard NLGI2 hardness grease, which is not too soft and holds the bearing balls nicely in place. For bicycle bearings, softer greases are quite okay, perhaps even better technically, but they make uh, maintenance more difficult because the balls won't stay in place as easily, especially with zero and softer greases. With NLGI1, it's also okay. You can get away with it, but I've had no problems using grease of this hardness and it's worked fine for me for decades. And we need the new bearing bolts. And so all I'm doing now is making sure my hands don't have any any sort of uh, dirt or parts of sand or something. And I'm taking the bearing bolts and putting them inside. This one will take nine bolts. That's what I will do on both sides. I will turn it around to help gravity work for me when I'm placing this. If I drop one, I just let it fall on the floor and take a new one. I don't clean them and reuse them because I think it's not not worth risking contaminating the, the bearing with the sand on a, on a bearing ball. Okay, how many we have here? Four, six, eight, one more. That's it. We should have nine bearing balls inside here. Okay, now the next thing that I would do is put some more grease on top, just in case, and smear it around. And now I will use a clean screwdriver. And remove any of the grease that would get in the way of the axle when I insert it. So I'm just cleaning it on the inside. I'm not scratching the balls, I'm using the side of the screwdriver and I put all the grease away and I also do this here. That's good enough, okay? Now it's time to put the left hand side dust seal back and before I insert it I will put some anti-seize paste on its sides. It's not really necessary, but I sleep better doing it this way. Okay, I will wipe the front section to prevent any anti-seize from mixing with the grease and now I will put it into the hub. When I'm doing this I'm paying attention to put it straight, not like this. It needs to go in straight, as straight as possible, and to push it all the way as far as it will go. If it won't go far enough, you can use a rubber mallet to knock it in place. Generally, it, it works okay. I'm like wiping it clean, and I will give it a a bit of a hit. Okay. It looks nice. Now, it's seated all the way in, checking if some bearing balls have moved. No, it all looks good. Now I can do the same thing on the opposite side. 
when you're working with free hubs, make sure to not get grease, a lot too much grease that can enter between the free hub mechanism and this like a lock nut for the free hub because you don't want to get the grease from getting inside these poles inside will get then glued with grease and uh, it might prevent it from working properly so here you can overdo it and too much grease can be a problem for all the other sides and front wheels if you put too much grease the all the extra just gets pushed out and it's not a problem balls uh, bearing balls that uh, you that see a lot of that see very high uh, rates of rotation very fast rotations they they cannot take too much grease they will overheat and have problems but with bicycle wheels the rotation even when you're riding downhill very fast are for bearing balls it's not thousands of rpm so it's not a problem and having a bit of too much grease extra grease won't cause them any harm no overheating and such problems some even argue that putting as much grease as possible can prevent water and dirt from intruding the bearings i'm not so sure about that but i'm sure that having too little grease for bicycle bearings is a lot worse than having a bit more than necessary so i choose to err on the side of caution Once again, I'm using a clean screwdriver to wipe off any, any extras. This looks okay. All right. Now we put back the dust seal. Trying to keep it straight. Now I'm pushing it, trying to keep it parallel and straight as much as possible well that went well <laughs> okay back to the drawing board when this happens it's usually the best thing to take it out and and restart and perhaps reset the bearing bolts now I'm trying to push it in nice and even keep it parallel Okay, it went in, it looks good, it looks okay. All right, now it's the time to put the axle back in. Now before I put the axle back in, I put some grease along this, this road where the bearing balls go. It's probably not needed because I've already greased the the bearings in the hub but this is just just to be on the safe side same thing with the left cone I need to make a video about this grease gun is it's super handy it helps a lot this is has it 2162m it's brilliant I get 10% of each one sold okay now the time to put this back in this is as we did the right hand side and so it goes in from the from the right hand side where the cassette is because it's not symmetrical the left hand side has different spacers so that's why we needed to to pay attention All right sliding it in parallel it's in now i'm keeping it pushed in holding against the spokes going to the other side and now we need to place the cone first and before I screw it in I will put some mounting anti-seize paste on these threads to make sure it all goes smoothly and doesn't get seized and stuck now I can start turning this once I've got it a few turns in I can keep pulling on it and turn the, the opposite side so that it goes in quickly making sure not to dislodge any bearing balls on this side the bearing balls on the opposite side are held by the the opposite side cone so they cannot move
Okay. All right. Now I don't need to keep this super tight. Just to make sure that it's it's there. Okay. This is good enough. I will need to <clears throat> to set the bearing preload. But first thing is I need to put this spacer. And here it goes. And now for the lock nut. Before I place the lock nut, I will put some anti-seize on the lock nut face that goes against the spacer to make it easier later on to remove it and put some anti-seize on the threads as well. Okay, that looks good. Now let's do it. All right, it's assembled now. Now all we need to do is set the preload and then lock it in place. Now about bearing preload, the cup and cone bearings work by having the the cup and the, the the cup and the cone hold the bearings in between each other. The bearings are here, they are trapped, and if you make the bearing have a bit of a clearance so it's not preloaded, they will hit each other and they will not move very the bearing balls will not roll and it will not work properly. Also, if you over tighten it, the bearing balls will start to, to create uh, like burrs or pitting in the their section when they, where they are rolling, both in the cup, in the cup and in the cone, and it will damage it. So it's important to have the optimal preload. So not too much, but also to not have any clearance, like no preload at all, and have them loose. And how do you do that? For that. With this quick release, uh, with the hubs that have full axle, no, so no, no quick release that are full, you just need to keep tightening until there is no play, and that's it. You keep tightening it by one eighth of a turn, check for play, and if there, when you see that is no, there's no play after the last one eighth or one sixteenth of a turn of retightening, it's done. But with uh, with these uh, quick release hollow axles, there's another catch because when you tighten a quick release lever. And when you tighten it, it further presses and reduces the clearance. It presses the, the cones a bit further more towards each other. So you need to have a bit of a play before you close this and have it disappear when you close it. And this is how I do it. I put these two spacers, put one on one side, then put the quick release lever in and the other on the opposite side. And then I close the quick release lever. And first, I just get it to be clear, to be no, to be no, no play. And as I've done here, pressing this thing finger tight. So I'm going with the the cone, tightening it finger tight. Then the lock nut, and now I will lock them in place. Cone wrench and the 70 millimeter wrench, and I'm locking them in place. Not using too much force. This is just gentle. And now I will, I will check for play. There should be play this way where the quick release lever is released. Okay, I'll put the quick release lever on the on the opposite side to, so you can easily follow what I'm doing. Sorry. I need these spacers because I want the quick release lever to be pushing against the lock rings, as will be the case when the wheel is put inside the on the bicycle. I don't want them to be pushing directly onto the axle. It's not the same. All right. Now, I'm checking for play with the quick release lever released. There should be some play. No, I can sense no play, no rocking. So when I tighten the quick release lever, the bearings will be too tight and they will not spin very smoothly. So here what I will do, it's easier if you can put and hold the axle in a vise so it doesn't turn but you can also do it this way. I will loosen the, the lock ring just slightly. Okay, it's now almost completely loose. Now I will put the wrench on the opposite side to hold the opposite side lock ring, which is very tight. And I will unscrew this by roughly 1 16th of a turn. I'm unscrewing the cone. The opposite side will stay locked. 
okay it's not moving very easily so I'll further loosen this all right now trying it again okay I've managed to move it a bit it's now getting tight against the lock nut as I'm unscrewing it it's getting more tight against the lock nut and creating more clearance towards the bearings and now I will just further tighten them to check for play if there were too much play I would go in the opposite direction now let's see when this is loose can I notice some play perhaps now we have all these spacers moving around so I will tighten the lock nut without really forcing it it's just very gentle and now I should still be able to notice some play yes there is play okay now I will tighten it properly here tightening this side and now try to lock it okay spinning smoothly and there's just on one spot maybe just a little bit of play but this is still not tight to the proper lock uh, proper quick release tightening torque so I'll try to just further tighten it a bit and give it a try all right it's spinning smoothly but, but there's no play okay this looks good I got it right if there were now still play uh, then I would have to do the opposite thing loosen the lock nut slightly not all the way so that everything starts turning just make it a bit less tight and then see if I can tighten the cone a bit just one sixteenth of a turn and then re-tighten the lock nut so it is a bit of a trial and error but you can get it right again for axles that are not for cup and for quick release you do this without tightening the wheel in the in the dropouts you don't need this extra step but for quick release levers it's of crucial importance to test for play there should be play when the quick release is not engaged and when the quick release is engaged to the proper torque as i've explained in my video about the proper use of the quick release lever when it's properly engaged the play should disappear if the bearing starts turning very roughly after the quick release is engaged that means that the preload is still set for too much preload even if you notice some play when the quick release is loose so test for whether it spins smoothly it should spin smoothly and also test if there is any play if there's play that means that the bearing is too loose so you need to retighten it front wheels have a, a bit thinner weaker axles so they will compress more when you operate quick release levers so when you're setting them up you need to have a bit more play compared to the rear axles for quick release levers it comes a bit with practice but you will notice it the rear axles should have a minimal sensible amount of play because it doesn't compress nearly as much when you tighten the quick release i will try to catch it now on camera but i'm not sure if it will be possible removing these distractions and now let's see this side it's more visible you can notice a bit of a play and when you put this into into a wheel when you mount it then you will notice the the wheel when you rock it it will create like some sort of a of a cradle move a bit then stop so that's a way to notice play when the wheel is mounted so this is i think i've explained everything i haven't missed to show and demonstrate anything it's very long detailed but i try to explain all the gotchas and all the caveats that you might face when you're servicing bicycle hubs i will make a separate video about cartridge bearing hubs but for now this is what what's most commonly available in my country and most of the hubs serviced are like this and uh, this is a very good system because it allows you to use very cheap tools and do it at home yourself and if you service shimano hubs once a year or every 5000 kilometers they last for decades i've had them 
last even when I, I ride all whole year round, even in winter and everything. And it's a decent solution and works cheaply and reliably and it's okay. That's it. Thank you for watching and cheers.